And so no fail is just kind of bringing it back to like, hey man, what were you taught when you learned how to ride a bike? Having a flyer go off somewhere else is almost as serious as a shot going off somewhere else. I think because I mean, the original left and right, the were like, what, 60 rooms or something like yep. that? Yeah. 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 Hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today's episode is number 273, The Evolution of Doctrine and Tactics. Today is September 19th, 2021. We have a great panel to discuss this. We have a bunch of guys that have been there, done that. Some of them might have even been part of the reason why some tactics or policies or doctrine were even made. Um, it's going to be kind of a cool discussion. Have some definitely some headliners on as the panelists. So before we start, big thanks to our sponsors, big thanks to Big Tech's Ordinance. So basically, I say this all the time, Big Tech's is one of those companies when I'm looking for something, I need to buy a gun product. If I need to buy cat crap, if I need to buy, you name it, a light, a gun part, anything. I pretty much have to look at every single category they have available because I know that there's something I'm forgetting. And I can't stand it when I, when I place the order and then realize, oh, I should have ordered this or I forgot that or it arrives. And then I realize, oh, I should have ordered that. So it's so much easier just to go category by category. Uh, along with that, they also have kind of a, uh, there's a sales bin area. Sure. There are things on sale all the time, but there are also some used things uh, that are very competitively priced in excellent working order. So the, one nice thing also with big techs, uh, they are, they're uh, friends, not only friends of primary and secondary, they're friends of the friends of primary and secondary. Uh, just a wonderful group of people uh, who are very active in the community and they do a really good job at what they do. So that's big techs. Uh, also, big thank you to Filster Holsters. So we have the Enigma, we have the Floodlight, we have the Flex system, we have all kinds of stuff. Hell, the, the, the switches on weapon lights. So many cool things that, that Filster does, and they continue doing really cool stuff. Not only are they making awesome products, but they also provide great content. So if you're trying to explain to someone how a holster is optimally going to work or what people should be looking into when they, when they go and buy a holster, Filster, uh, not only are they selling great stuff, but their YouTube channel and their Facebook group provide some wonderful content to help everyone. It's kind of like primary and secondary. Um, some of the best holsters uh, available now. Uh, it, it's, it's cool that there are so many really good companies that support each other, that can be friends, that can be competitors and uh, uh, be able to share a, a table at dinner. And it's just awesome. So that's, that's Filster. Primary arms, if you are mil active military, a veteran, or a first responder, primary arms government wants to help you get the best prices possible on guns, gear, and more. With over 500 brands and 1,500 different products stocked, primary arms carries one of the most comprehensive selections of tactical hunting and competition products. Their military and law enforcement discount program gives an additional 10% off many of the most sought after brands including Benelli, Noveski, Sons of Liberty Gunworks, and Wilcox Industries. For more information, visit Primary Arms. They also have a bunch of optics uh, under their own name, and I have a few. And so far, I've, I've been happy with them. Um, also, similar to Big Techs, they're one of those brands that when you're going to buy something, you might want to go through every single category to make sure you're not missing anything. Um, also, big thank you to Staccato. So on duty, I carry a Staccato. Let's see here. Where? Oh, it's in the holster. It's not on my wall. Uh, awesome pistol. Absolutely love it. Um, if you haven't tried one out, if 1911s or 2011s are a little, I don't know, intimidating, because that's how I felt initially, it's a good idea to try it out. See if, see if it's for you. It might take a couple tries. It might take a couple magazines, a couple thousand rounds. Who knows? Uh, there are plenty of people that have them. That, that would be willing to let you borrow it or to try it out. Over at the uh, training summit, Staccato was present. We had a one of their, their master gunsmiths there who was giving people tours of the, the various Staccato pistols and letting anyone that wanted to shoot them. And overall, it was an awesome experience. I've been a big fan of Staccato. They've, they've, they're making great, great pieces. Um, yeah, the, the little C2s are just so cool. 
that's staccato. Um, also, so those are single action pistols we're talking about. Then we can talk about the striker fired poly pistols made by Walther. So let's see here behind me, I have, let's see here, one, two, three, four, four, yep, I'm recounting. It appears that I have four Walthers behind me. I have, obviously I have the PPK because you need to have that. That's the James Bond gun. Oh, and I'll get it later. But uh, the brand new PDP pistols, poly framed awesome textures to the grips, great capacity, awesome accuracy, wonderful, absolutely wonderful triggers. And then also they're all out of the box ready for red dots. It's pretty dang cool. It's the stuff that we were dreaming about years ago and now we have it. And now it's a reality. Uh, as far as striker fired pistols are concerned, out of everything that I've owned and everything I've tried, uh, the PDPs, I'm liking the most. Now that being said, yes, Walther has sent these to me. I did not buy them. As a matter of fact, they sent me, was it last September to, to do a demo thing with them, a promotional training event. And right then and there, I already liked the PPQ, the, but that PDP, it's even better. Um, just like with Staccatos, if you get, get a chance, try it out. See if it's for you. See if you like it. Most likely you will. Um, they do come in different shapes, sizes, and flavors if you like black. But yeah, you have... Uh, Compacts, you have full size, you have the five inch barrel, you have the, yeah, all kinds of configurations. So that is Walther. Lastly, big thank you to our uh, Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. Um, a big thing that Patreon did that a lot of people don't know, the Patreon supporters were a major force behind the last training summit. Uh, those funds help pay for it all. Those funds help pay to get the instructors out to pay for all kinds of uh, range supplies. So that is greatly appreciated. Thank you to all the supporters. Speaking of supporters, uh, thank you for, for watching, listening, and all that good stuff. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, because it's kind of needed. Uh, feel free to also to comment. Uh, really interested to hear your comments. Uh, sometimes these comments also turn into additional episodes. I'm always excited to read uh, feedback. Additionally, we do have, not only are we doing these, not only do we do videos and podcasts, we also have 736 different Facebook groups. We have a website with articles. We have a forum that you can go and use. So right now I'm on a 24 hour jail stint on Facebook. So guess what? Hey, we can, we can go and use the forum. So there's that. So I think, I think now's about the time that we should probably start the show. Uh, my background's in law enforcement, been doing the cop thing for over 20 years, currently a patrol sergeant. Um, I've, I've dabbled with various policy on both sides, or there be three sides of policy, the follower, the non-follower, and the creator. I don't know. Um, constantly studying up on tactics. It's interesting to see how things change, but I really look forward to this, this conversation. Kurt, how about you? Uh, Kurt Weber, 22 years in special forces. I've been a contractor, mostly for state department for the last 15. Uh, I teach police, uh, on a foreign aid program. So I go to foreign countries and teach their police how to do stuff. Ken. Yes. Uh, old man, probably of the group at this point, uh, uh, originally naval special warfare at SEAL team one. <clears throat> I uh, did a bunch of, uh, got out, really, we weren't fighting anybody. It was pretty frustrating, actually. Uh, got out, did a bunch of temporary active duties. Uh, ended up working uh, for Department of Navy as a civil servant. Did about 10 years there. And that was really the genesis of my first exposure and push into force on force and low life. Ended up being the director of Surefire Institute. Uh, pushed a bunch of buttons there pushed a bunch of doctrine forward, uh, and this discussion is about doctrine, but I uh, ended up uh, also starting a couple other commercial companies. I still dabble, have a, have a shingle out. I'm going to be doing some uh, classes in 2022 uh, with some law enforcement agencies, and really those have been my primary customers, uh, former military guy learning to speak law enforcement as a non-law enforcement guy, but basically uh, 
uh, you know, the credential there is I'm not part of the institution, so I don't institutionally think. I look outside the box and say, hey, you guys may want to consider this or that. So that's it. Cool. Bill? Uh, uh, retired copper, been uh, almost four years now. I've been retired. Uh, I was a cop for 20, 25 and a half years, a, uh, a suburb of Seattle, the city of Kent, uh, here in Washington State. And then prior to that, I was in the Army for six years. Um, the doctrinal shit, of course, my, my intro to that was the Army and <clears throat> and seeing what trade was putting out and, you know, looking at all the various pubs and this and that and everything, trying to make the force be consistent. And then when I became a cop, it was kind of, I guess, eye-opening. Um because almost every police agency is fucking different, right? Even not just regionally, but within a region, you'll find a lot of differences with uh, within law enforcement of how they're doing shit. And, and so some of that stuff at the, uh, at the basic academy level and what they were teaching, um, I guess more of that, that would be at least in my state. Um, I mean, the state legislature has some input into what gets taught at the basic academy. The director who is a civilian position has a lot of input at what gets uh, done at the basic academy and getting all that shit to change um, is less than nimble sometimes and, and a big pain in the ass. So um, working through some of those bugs, or at least trying to as a training unit supervisor before I retired. Um, and then within my own organization, just trying to enact change and, you know, how can we affect, uh, you know, uh, get the training to the guys to, to update them on what we have changed which is also problematic in some cases, um, you know, you still got a job to do and, and, and that kind of crap. And so pulling dudes into training was less easy than when I was a, a, a section sergeant in the army. And then I, I knew I had at least once a week, my sergeant's time, I could get with my guys and, and do some shit. So just challenges across the board, that shit on the SWAT side of the house, um, same exact shit. I mean, uh, within, there was a point where was still a Washington state tactical Officer association um, when it first started up. You know, and this is before I became a SWAT guy. But their whole intent was uh, commonality and tactics and training so that um, across the state of Washington, I should be able to dovetail in with any team and, and be speaking the same language and understand the tactics and do all that shit. So if we had some type of mass event, um, a dude from my team could could potentially jump onto a, a group of dudes from Tacoma and Pierce County and Olympia and this and that, and, and we could kind of do the same shit. And, and that did not work out, by the way. Um, lots of teams while still, still doing shit, <clears throat> but trying to get everybody to be, be the same flavor um, just wasn't fucking working done it, it, and I, for a variety of reasons. So uh, pretty interesting topic. I, uh, when you popped up, this is what we're going to talk about. I was kind of excited to, to have, have a part of this thing and see what the other guys think about some of this shit. Ian, Tashima. So my, back, my background is not quite as illustrious as our fellow panelists. However, uh, background is eight years Marine Corps. Uh, then I got out and GWAT kicked off. So jumped in, spent about 12 years in the Army now uh, in the California National Guard. And uh, my, my knowledge of doctrine was basically forced by uh, interacting with the folks at TRADOC quite a bit, uh, the current and the two prior um, lead writers specifically for uh, maneuver center of excellence. So the proponent for small arms, uh, the individual weapons specifically. So having to interact with those folks, I it forced my hand. I had to learn to speak the institutional language uh, without which there's no common, you're not really communicating. So uh, across the board, um, I, I had to do a deep dive on it. So uh, that's, that's where I fit into this broader conversation. And I do find as well that there is a misunderstanding of what doctrine is uh, it, especially this uh, concept that, you know, Americans never follow their own doctrine. Well, in fact, I will say we do because it provides some flexibility. It's, it's not a strict adherence kind of thing. So anyway, um, so my slice of it, uh, I, I was nowhere near being the lead writer for any of the stuff that applies to the Army, but I, I did interact quite a bit and I had an opportunity to provide input on a bunch of stuff that's current out there. So that's my background. Cool. Chuck? Maybe. Great noises. Yeah. So uh, he was known as Roland for a while. Uh, there he is. Mess around with sound settings. My microphone's jacked up. Yep. I had the same problem. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. All right. Well. Yes, I won't be using my fancy microphone tonight. Um, 
So what are we doing? No, oh, Intro? just intros. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Pressburg, I'm a retired Army guy. I started uh, training about five years ago. Um, during my uh, during my time in the Army, I, I did some lesson plan development, training, training plan development, uh, SOP development stuff. Uh, so, yeah. That's what I got going on. Cool. So, where do you guys want to start with this huge topic? How, how do tactics or doctrine even begin? What, what, in your guys' I, I think, opinions? I think laying out exactly what doctrine is and isn't might be a good spot. Sure. Uh, a broad definition of it or, or explanation of what it is. Uh, and I'll try to kick that aspect off from the Army, U.S. military side, but Army specific. So every profession has its body of knowledge, its best practices. And um, the Army broadly has four main pillars of, of best practices because we have different professions within the Army. We've got, we, we need to, uh, so the administration of the organization. So in the Army, we find that in regulations and TA pamphlets. We've got the maintenance side of things. So we have that in terms of technical manuals. We've got the, um, uh, we've got the, um, uh, I'm being a dumb dumb right now, the operations of the warfighting aspect. So uh, you'll find tactics and procedures in FMs, for example. And then finally, the training side of it in, in terms of uh, training circular specifically. So broadly in the Army, is, it's just your best practices. In fact, it's, it's a guide to action and not a template for action. And you must be able to flex to it. Doctrine is authoritative, but it must be, uh, you must use judgment in its application. So um, that is uh, how we look at it broadly uh, from the Army side of the house. Ken, you're up. Okay, got it. Uh, quick, quickly, uh, doctrine, I'm going to have to say, is a broad foundation of beliefs, uh, which, you know, and they can be codified, of course. Uh, so if you think about a church, you know, doctrine, this is our doctrine. We believe A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, and then um, you can go to 10 different churches and they, of course, apply that doctrine differently. And for me, tactics is the actual touching of the opponent. It's, it's you know, it's different than strategy as well. But uh, uh, if, you, if you float it all the way up, doctrine is what we believe. And, and um, it could be, uh, you know, how you wear a uniform, you know, it could be a bunch of different things, but um, I'm not, a, I, I, I'm going to have to say just from my limited viewpoint that doctrines, uh, you, you want to float way up there, make them broad brush strokes. And you know, I, I heard uh, Ian already talk about, you know, it's authoritative. It's like, how so, you know, um, you know, that when you get down to, we're going to, enter a room like this, we're going to sweep a field like this, we're going to take an airfield like that, you know, you get into standard operating procedures and actually imp learning how to implement them and train to successfully and, and consistently do them, uh, you know, that's, that's another matter. You know, how, how are you going to implement your beliefs? How are you going to get those across, uh, you know, across the units? And uh, they end up sliding all over the place. And that's probably part of the issue. Everybody wants to get into a room successfully. You know, everybody wants to take a guy down in, in law enforcement without necessarily killing him. You know, that's a belief system. That's our doctrine. How are we going to do that? That's a pretty broad, uh, you know, a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, and a lot of sacred territory. People tend to uh, uh, believe... <laughs> that their way is the way. And I, and over 30 years of training across a wide variety of units, uh, it's been interesting for me to go, hey, I get it. I, I get your belief systems, but you actually can't make them happen. And here's why. And um, take a look at these ideas that might give you a little more fluidity. And um, so, you know, I was never, I've been in institutions and people like to get it all on a book, you know, lawyerized and approved by everybody. Uh, the only problem is at the end of the process, it may not actually work. And they end up, you know, the operators know that and they're frustrated. 
So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. So doctrine, big picture belief systems uh, that we hopefully can agree upon, and then you move it down into uh, philosophy, strategies, and tactics from there, and you, you move your way down into the actual hands-on. Uh, I, I was just going to say, to add to what Ian said, is it, if doctrine is like the highest level of the, what you're doing, then how the strategy, the TTMP, how all of those things work into and fit within doctrine to for what your mission is. And, and this is a, a big argument within special forces right now of how, how do we approach our doctrine, mostly because to I, I will counter what Ian said, most SF guys don't understand their own doctrine. And Chuck, I saw a nod there. Yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> I, I was raised in a culture with a, a pretty progressive squad leader uh, when I was a fire team leader that uh, he was not willing to just blindly do it because this is the way that we've always done it. And so uh, standard operating procedures and uh Th things like that, some of which were spelled out. I mean, you talk about like RTEP 7-8 drill, it's pretty black and white about how to uh, lay down a base of fire and conduct fire and maneuver with an infantry platoon. Uh, the steps are laid out right, right there in front of you. And then there's a training path that supports becoming fully trained in that, in that skill. And so as we wanted to do things like, uh, you know, conduct a feint attack instead of uh, laying down a support by fire or w whatever, his point was you have to be able to talk as articulately as an officer does about the stuff that is contained within our manuals, because that is the baseline that you are now diverging off of on, on your own tangent. Yes. And if you cannot properly articulate what the book answer is, then how can you explain why what you want to do needs to differ from the book answer? And so it was the foundation to, critical thought and applying uh, out of the box solutions to tactical problem sets is the book says we need to do it this way. These are the environmentals or the Met TC considerations that are uh, choosing that I am uh, applying and uh, recommending that we break from standard of policy and procedures and do it this other way. And <laughs> And this is what I think we're going to get out of it or, or whatever. But Green Beret is not knowing their doctrine, infantry, NCOs, talking like knuckle draggers in a conversation with the big kids. When you're talking about training, company commander is the primary trainer. So when you're out there on a tactical stick slain or whatever, and the CO has got this canned bullshit, no training value, uh, event that is set up because it's cookie cutter plug and play we already have a risk assessment for it whatever you've got to be able to articulate and down to the nuance exactly what that that uh tactic technique and procedure is supposed to look like and, and why it, you think it's not it's not optimal absolute subject matter um dominance of the material it's like an officer that wants to deviate from the established norms uh, based on the, the what's going on on the streets. If you can't even articulate policy, how are you going to be able to talk yourself out of uh, a situation where you got to choke a bitch? You know what I mean? Like you got to know, you got to know what the, the left and right limits are to articulate why you, why you departed. Yeah, our, our thing in SF right now is about the, the unconventional warfare mission uh, with the, war in Afghanistan more or less being over the shift out of direct action, unilateral mission for special forces back to the conventional warfare is one of the, one of the big prime missions. Most guys don't know what it means. They don't, they don't understand that it's actually a doctrinal mission because they tend to conflate unconventional warfare with unconventional everything else. 
And it's like, yes, everything in special operations is unconventional. That's why we're special. But spe- unconventional warfare is a specific doctrinal meaning or doctrinal mission with a meaning. And guys forget that. Or they never learned it. I'd like to dovetail on what Chuck uh, had mentioned in that uh, speaking with authority on the terms you use at the most basic level. So commonly, I'll find folks throw around um, TTPs. They'll say TTP this or that. When in fact, they don't even understand the difference between a tactic, a technique, and a procedure, nor can they articulate exactly what is prescriptive and what is um, non-prescriptive. Um, uh, so tactics in, in the Army def- in the army world, anyway, is the uh, employment and order duration of forces in relation to each other. And this is a standard can speech I give to some of the younger folks that uh, throw words around or that um, don't have a complete understanding of when I say procedure, what is a procedure? A procedure, for example, is very prescriptive. You must do it X, Y, and Z lockstep across the organization. An example of that would be a nine-line medevac request. It speeds communication. It's a standard format for it. That is very prescriptive. It's, it's not uh, to be deviated from, uh, as opposed to a, uh, a technique which is non-prescriptive, and you have the ability to flex in and out of what the stair-step progression of accomplishing um, uh, a task, a function, a, a mission is. So just broadly understanding that when we talk about procedures, if we talk about a loading procedure for your weapon, do we in this organization always do a press check? How do we, do we push pull? What, what exactly do we do? Uh, getting a little in the weeds right there, but just understanding the terms that we're using speeds communication and and we don't need to be as wordy and it makes things a little more efficient. So um, uh, a term, so one of the elements of doctrine in the army is terms and symbols along with principles and these TTPs. So if I tell you to go clear a room or clear a building, you know already, if you know this stuff and you should, what I mean by clear. I don't need to tell you lockstep exactly what to do. So that kind of goes into I'll, I'll leave mission orders out of this for a little while, but but just understanding the words that we use is extremely important. And I'm not even getting into even like higher level stuff, which isn't higher level, but you talk to, you know, a dude on a machine gun and I, I've heard Chuck rant about this and I've encountered it plenty of times. I think it was where I'm going with it is uh, the classes of fire and machine gun theory. A lot of these dudes don't even know what they're talking about. They, they have no clue. Uh, they just don't have an understanding. Of it. And, and that's just the most biggest line uh, thing you need to know is remembering these definitions and knowing just the basic concepts and, and what these words are that you're that you're using when in fact you're probably using them correctly. Bill, how about you? There have been some law enforcement things. We we, we might be able to talk now. Uh, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of the same shit as, as the guys were talking. I remember back in the day looking at Light Fighter and, and uh, the homie on there, uh, Sneaky SF dude, um, who I never met. I don't know who the fuck that guy is, but uh, but I remember him bringing this up. Basically, you don't know, you know what the fucking definition of strategy is or tactics are, or technique, this, that, the other thing. Uh, and I remember at that time in my spot cross, you, you know, he's kind of right. I mean, I think, I, I think I'm probably doing those things, but I haven't defined them to be able to point out and go, this is that or, or whatever the shit. So um, I, I think that kind of started uh, the journey into that higher level of, I guess, knowledge base of, of what the fuck those words mean and how do they apply to my shit and, and also trying to break them down to a point where it was understood, um, you know, across the board. And, and uh, so, I mean, I, I guess it's part of my team leader class and I, I guess it is part of my team leader class. Now I talk about here is a definition of strategy. Here is a definition of tactics. Here's a definition of techniques, um, procedures, that type of shit. And, and the way that I define them, I think Ian's last comment was, um, was interesting to me uh, and maybe because it's uh, i think i think big army and i could be fucked up too right i'm recognized i was only in for six years and, and and that type of shit but it seemed like big army um was directly subservient and conscious of what trade doc was putting out and what at least as at the company command level my rec- recollection was company commanders were very keen on what was required for certain things when I, mean, I was assuming because that was part of their their oer so they were they were hip to make us do exactly what the fuck trade off was putting out and that you know through common task testing and uh, sqt testing and that type of shit there was a, there was a commonality there so i mean even, even, i bounced from fort knox to germany back to fort lewis um and in all those cases going into scout platoons um and there was very little that was different other than the vehicle i happened to be sitting on at that at that time <laughs> 
So I think that is a thing on the Army side of the house that is probably beneficial if you're bouncing unit to unit to unit on the cop side of the house where you tend to stay where the fuck you're at for a while. I don't know if that uh, level of commonality is um, is a good thing. And I would say it's probably a fucking bad thing on a national level because the way you police in Utah may not be the way I need to police here in Washington, um, you know, and being conscious of all the demographics and other bullshit. So I don't think you could do, I think if a, a national police force is about the worst fucking idea ever um and so there i don't think you're, you're ever going to see now <laughs> you see see that level coming out with that being said though i have no fucking doubt that i could lateral down to utah right now uh go to work for your pd and within a very short period of time once i figured out local laws the state statutes uh, how what, what the fuck you guys call them you know i mean i might say hey that's fucking robbery one and you're like nah dude that's you know robbery with fucking whatever the shit or you know whatever the hell your state statute is uh, and so I don't think there would be that big of a difference. Um, I mean, police work, police work, right? If I contact people, you talk to them, see what the fuck's going on. Um, you know, the arrest procedures are, are fairly fucking common. Um, it's nuance. You know, yeah, I mean, it's exactly. That's a great word for it. There's a little bit of nuance here or there. I mean, we've certainly heard a shitload of laterals. Um, and depending on where they lateral from, that, that transition was either very easy and in some cases difficult. East Coast policing, particularly big city East Coast policing, was a fuckload different uh, than yes. what we were doing um, compared to West Coast dudes, even coming from smaller organizations where the policing model is, is fairly consistent. And, and not that it's not on the East Coast. I would assume the same thing. A West Coast guy transitioning to the East Coast probably had some problems as well um, or, or maybe more to learn. So, um, I mean, this is a whole big fucking topic of shit, right, of, uh, of – you're starting to open up here, at least on the cop side of the house. I don't know. I mean, the mill guys, maybe they're, they're thinking this is really not, you know, that big of a discussion, but maybe it is. Uh, it's just, it is odd. We hired a motherfucker, man. I don't, I don't owe him nothing. So whatever the fuck, New York city, right. And this dude sitting in my office when I was training your supervisor and I'm um, talking about shit and he's talking about, you know, he's the, he's the man and he makes all these callers and all the dudes are mad at him. Cause he's always working so hard and this and that and the other thing. And I said, Oh no shit, dude, how many, how many motherfucking arrests you make? Cause I don't even keep that stat. Right. I mean, I mean, I don't know how many motherfuckers I arrested in a year. Um, and I said, hey, no shit. How many, how many fucking dudes you arrest in a year, man? And I said a hundred. And I said, that's it, bitch. That's it. You bet the lowest performing motherfucker up in this piece, right? I mean, how this shit goes up in here. You're going to take calls, clear them bitches, and move to the next uh, before you finish your paper. And my ass said, well, what about a lunch break? I said, you don't get a lunch break, dude. And then he was like, well, I carry a sandwich in my pocket. <laughs> that way, if I get stuck on a long call, I got a snack. I was like, <laughs> you can carry a fucking sandwich if you want to, man. But, you know, you ain't getting a lunch break. So I think that's a pretty clear difference in culture right that, that's going on from one agency to the next and and, and so i guess that's my my thoughts on, on a lot of this right now I mean, it's just I, it may be harder to for me to join this conversation with with the meal dudes in here because it's you know it's it, it is a completely different type of shit now you know locally i think i can talk a little bit about the shit what, what doctrinally speaking and what is strategy and techniques and tactics and that type of bullshit but on a national level that that, that conversation doesn't belong here so quickly to um, address with something, it's an astute and valid observation that, um, and then I'll shut the heck up so we can have these smarter people talk, um, is th this tendency for, so I got to get a little army fight here. So there's institutional, there's operational, um, and, and there's a third one, but institutionally. So when you go to the big schoolhouses, when you go to a national training center and you go through an evolution, and then you AAR it with the observer controllers or the OCs, uh, they'll ask you what was supposed to happen. So they retreat back to what's in the book. And it's a very lockstep. Did you do it this way? Did you not do it that way? Operationally, um, you have to be able to uh, justify why you deviated and assume risk by deviating from what is in the book. So you got to take the book and then set it aside and then use it to adapt to novel situations. If you can't do that, you are just a robot repeating stuff and don't actually own the knowledge. And only girlfriend back there. Jo Joe's getting naked for me. So again. Um, yes, again, oh, I'm keeping my clothes on this time. So um, it's kind of similar to that adult learning theory, this pyramid known as Bloom's taxonomy. So at the base level, you've got simple rote memory of numbers, figures, and then just bits of knowledge. And as you go to the top of the pyramid of, of this taxonomy of, of adult understanding, uh, you get to the point where you can apply 
in these novel situations where you can apply it to new situations that you haven't encountered before, uh, maintaining the principles that are in play, like a bold flanking maneuver, uh, and how you actually execute it, you will adjust, but you still want to come around to the side. And, and the people that adhere like so strictly to what's in the book don't really then understand what's in the book. And this kind of goes to uh, when people say Americans are the worst at doctrine because we don't follow it. Uh, but you know, when you consider that a tactic uh, and a technique are non-prescriptive, as long as you get the shit done, that's what matters. And um, so when we deviate from the book and we don't follow what's in the book, what's in that doctrine, you know, that's why people say, well, we're, we're the worst at following it. Well, in fact, I will say when we don't follow, we are kind of still, we're still following it as long as we adhere to certain principles. That's all I have to say about that. Well, I think that kind of goes to, I think you were talking about earlier about understanding what the concepts even mean and that's where it starts and then going from there. And then unless you have a, Matt, a basic understanding of it, how do you apply it and how do you teach it? Matt, you locked up. Uh, can you say again after, well, can you say again all? Oh man. Am I, can you hear me now? Okay. So it, it kind of reminds me of what you said a little earlier and it was something along the lines of it's important to understand what the basic concepts are, the definitions, and that's where it starts. And then to be able to apply it as necessary and also to, to teach it. Cause I can think of uh, training a new officer. Yeah. They can, they can just repeat what they've been taught, but can they apply it and they can, they apply it in different circumstances. Really? No one has. Yeah. Good night, everybody. <laughs> so, we have Ken here, and I, I don't know if what I said earlier is making the final cut. Basically, Ken is known for, he's established some methodology with light use, which is highly effective. And because of his work, it has affected some people, it's influenced some people, and I think it's affected some tactics. And I think also we, we discussed this in a previous uh, episode on the, metho the methodology he used to determine, hey, this works, this doesn't. And that went right into, okay, how are we going to develop tactics or how are we going to develop tactics using some of these things on that dial up? There we go, Matt. Oh, uh, so we got, we got, we got most of it. Maybe okay. Last yeah. I'm supposed to have fast internet too. Yeah. Oh, well. So as I was saying, Ken knows a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. Uh, Look, you know, I guess, you know, we want to kind of keep this rolling and kind of talk around the topic and with the topic. Uh, I'm not a big, I've never been known to enjoy, appreciate, or follow rules. Uh, you know, and so that's my, always been my issue with doctrine and SOPs and procedures and tactics. So they're only as good at the end of the day as if they work. You know, I mean, at some point you have to say this whole edifice, all of this stuff that we built up and codified and uh, vetted out and wanted to get across the board to multiple units. And that's the problem with institutions like the Army, the Navy. You know, I, I was the course curriculum model manager for seven programs, the Department of the Navy. We couldn't just deviate because we, we knew there was a better way. You know, it, it took time to spread the change. Uh, and, you know, that's always uh, difficult at best because there's a lot of stakeholders in any given set of doctrine. Uh, you know, how it got developed, uh, it's hard to be. And in some ways, you don't want it to move too fast because then the next personality rolls in and says, well, I don't like it this way. I'm going to do it this way. You know, and you got 10,000 guys down range. So I, I get it. Uh, I just don't like it. I never did. Uh, and so that's why I joined, you know, became a SEAL. It's like, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in conventions. Uh, but yeah, we had our own set of SOPs. And I remember specifically and doctrines and beliefs. And I remember the guys in training, a lot of them had never even seen combat. You know, yet they were telling us what to do. And I, I did the German Shepherd head tail bomb, a bunch of stuff that they were 
uh, you know, telling us to do. And I remember uh, a few very key phrases from guys that have been there, done that, you know, recognizing, hey, you know, pull me over the side, look, just, just put up with this shit, but that's not how it goes. And so, you know, you have to pay your dues in any institution. Uh, you have to establish credibility. And then you got to figure the methodology by which you can affect change if change is required. Uh, so I recognize this. I recognize the behemoth. You know, I, I call doctrine in, in some of these larger institutions like a large freight train. It just gets moving, you know, and you're not going to easily change it. You're not going to easily stop it, even if it needs to get stopped or needs to get changed. So, you know, I went into my own journey and, you know, that's the benefit of having a small company. You can do what you want. And the question is, does anybody, you know, buy it into it? You know, uh, do they, uh, what you're saying, you know, does it make sense to them? Uh, and my whole bottom line was, does it work? Show me, show me, Brigham, make it happen. Let me see you consistently gun these people down in these circumstances because we can spar with guns now. Let's check it out. Uh, I remember going with LAPD uh, guys, uh, you know, I teach combatives in all my classes and uh, the LAPD came up with this large, you know, doctrine on, on their combatives. And it basically, it, it, it went around that Gracie Jiu Jitsu stuff because that was the flavor of the day. And, uh, you know, it had, it had, it was all lawyered up. It was all codified. It was all ready to rock. You know, everybody loved it. Doctors, you name it, except I asked guys, I said, okay, show me the shit. Literally, show it to me. Show, show me what you got going. Here's the situation. Make it happen. And they couldn't do it. You know, they could cite it chapter and verse, but they couldn't actually do it. And so to me, you know, at the end of the day, I kind of step back and go, I'm glad I'm not involved in all that. Uh, the only thing that matters to me is what works. And it's going to be your job, you know, the subject matter experts in their departments, uh, whether they were trainers or key leaders. I go, you got to figure out how to change it. You know, I can give you some clues, but you, you, you're you staring you straight in the face that it doesn't work. So there's this constant tension between here's what's been established, here's what needs to be changed, and then how can we change it and who's going to do the changing? And it's a war. So, you know, just because it's codified doesn't mean it's good, is my point. And just because it's new doesn't mean it's good or that you can actually implement it. So, you know, as trainers as mentors, you know, as people that do this stuff, uh, you know, I'm careful to, you know, recognize where I fit in. I've always been on the agent of change side. I'm an enzyme and uh, I can speak the language. I've done it. I've institutionally trained, you know, in, in, at levels that, you know, just it's grotesque. I, I can't stand it. People I had to rub elbows with and, and comply with, but that motivated me to go, you know what, I'm going to figure out how to change this. So I think change is, uh, as you know, if you know, wherever you're at, you need to be constantly looking for it. Uh, there was a book I read a long time ago, and I know I'm blathering, but why not? You know, uh, uh, this guy wrote a book, and it was basically how police officers live and why they die. And that book was really good for me. And again, I wasn't law enforcement. Basically, his whole shtick in that book as a forensic uh, guy was that law enforcement officers in combat look for a prescription. They look for something that they were taught. And all along the way, they were never allowed to adapt in their training. They never got to do any adult learning principles. A plus B equals C, no matter what. Do not deviate. And the problem is combat doesn't unfold like that. So you should know what A, B, and C is, but back to uh, you better be able to articulate that. And you better figure out why you changed it is also a responsibility. But that's not really given to police officers they're told to do something a particular way because the doctrine says to do it and everybody knows it doesn't work and so they figure out their own ways and so they kind of feel the weight of that constantly i know what the book says i know what the book says but it don't work uh so you know that's that's the problem with the book the, the, the good news about the book is we have a book to study and learn from but the book can also kill you. And there we are, you know, in practical terms. That's how I view it. Well, that reminds me of uh, new officers who have, let's see here, they go by the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law mm -hmm. and then adjust as necessary. Ken, that did book. Ken, did you write an article back in the day called uh, who is training who? Yes. All right. Great, great article. Um, 
and it, and it speaks highly to that, right? It was it footsteps on the fucking ground, dance the fucking polka on room entries, right? And and I think the short duration on SWAT for a, a lot of teams and and leaders on those teams, they learn to dance the polka, uh, and then when the fucking music changes, they can't do shit else. Uh, and I've used that article many times. I used to hand it out at, at my team at their classes. And I, I want you to learn how to dance all the fucking dances, man. That way, whatever music comes to fuck on, th then you put put the appropriate steps to the fucking tune. And that is something grossly missing in law enforcement because I think now we don't have enough training time, I think, for in for the general patrol officer uh, to learn all those dance moves. And then even a lot of the SWAT teams, which is another fucking thing, right? That designation doesn't mean shit in America because there's a lot of SWAT teams out there. Um, some more um, impressive than others, some with greater op tempo than others and, and, and that type of shit. And, and so I think sometimes it just gets fucking lost. And I do think that there's a whole bunch of what you learned first was is best type of thing going on. I think there's a lack of uh, mature leaders that stay in those positions um, to actually start to, to see where the breakdowns are and, and probably get enough operations where they've been opposed to see how the shit actually fucking works. Um, I mean, I, I, there's just a lot of stuff that goes on with that. And I, and I get you, I guess you could draw correlations to big army with, with some of that, right? As you get promoted, you, you start moving away from the, the tactical side into more of the administrative side. So, you know, and maybe that, at least in my era of the fucking army, I don't know now with, with the combat, you know, all, all the combat guys have seen the last 20 fucking years. Um, but I, I don't recall my first sergeant ever sitting me down as a young NCO, as an example, and talking to me about it. Hey man, there's some fucking shit you need to be considering. Um, it was more just, you know, can, can you pass the fucking test on the day? And I granted it was cold, it was cold war peacetime army type of shit. But I, I mean, his leadership was probably in that regard would be more important to me than him bringing me fucking, you know, hot chow and, and fucking mail call out in the field type of shit. Right. So, um, I, I think the same goes with the law enforcement side of the house. By the time you get some of that, I guess, experience, you've either fucking promoted up or gone on or your ass has become so fucking cynical. You don't want to talk to nobody anymore. <laughs> so you just take your squad car out and, you know, you go sit in the fucking North end in the industrial area and hope you don't get fucking dispatched for the next 10 goddamn hours. I, I don't know. It's interesting shit. Well, the GWAT has been good for developing a lot of new stuff. Uh, I, I'd imagine it's applicable to any other prolonged uh, military effort. Uh, we become very tailored to that very specific type of action. And a lot of knowledge falls by the wayside and a lot of people don't understand certain things anymore. So it is good for growth, but it also leads to pruning of knowledge that, I mean, hell, a lot of guys, majority of people, when they're machine gunning, they were doing something called free gunning without using a traverse this, this tripod with the T&E on it. And you talk to guys about that stuff nowadays and it seems like they don't have any, they, they don't know what they're talking about. So it, it, it is a good catalyst for expansion and learning and development and refinement, but at the same time, it's got some downsides to it. G1's like been sorry. great great for law enforcement, right? I would say across the board. I mean, I, I don't think my agency would not have issued individual PCs to do without the GWAT. My agency probably wouldn't have done some of the shit we done uh, we did with with weapons issue and the equipment that's on the guns without the GWAT. Uh, my team directly benefiting from uh, success in the GWAT uh, with NVG and a bunch of other shit. But but that cross doc doctrinization shit of of GWAT also brings some fucking bad shit to the cop side of the house, uh, like motherfuckers wearing a PC to go do a warrant pop off the back of their bear cap because that's what they wore in the stand. That is fucking shitty doctrine for a copper. Um, some of the stuff that potentially, you know, the constitutional limits that police officers have on them in America versus what the dude had going on in the GWAT. Um, and even though they may be very similar, my guess is the, the consequences, particularly today for an officer violating someone's constitutional rights in America versus a, a dude in Afghanistan doing something slightly untoward toward a fella, um, like throwing him out a window, as an example, um, that would probably get overlooked a little bit easier than a, a copper doing that without probable cause uh, in America. So uh, there's I think there's some shit. Um, it, it, it's just it's an interesting an interesting, interesting thing that as particularly as the training supervisor, right? I'm watching new guy. I mean, I, and I love the vets, right? I, I want all the veterans to come in shit. I was constantly hitting our recruiting man, go down to fucking JBLM and get them dudes, right? They, they know what's up. Um, but it was an interesting thing to watch them, you know, become cops and see how they would react to certain things. And, and then certainly the guys that were interested in getting on the team come in with a lot of combat experience. And, and a lot of times we had to, we had to pull the reins on them real fucking hard. Um, 
to, to get them back to reality, man, this ain't that bro. This is not that type of shit. So. I, I'm curious how much the, the GWAT actually affected doctrine, the, the overarching principles of doctrine, as opposed to the tactics and techniques for DA. Yeah. A whole lot of stuff changed, but how, how much of the big picture thing changed? I would probably say, I wouldn't say the big picture, not much at all. And I mean, it was interesting in the early, early days of the GWAT uh, popping off and, and we were, I mean, you know, we had already learned lessons about, uh, you know, make sure that you're selecting the right tactic for the problem. So, I mean, we, my team was already, we weren't doing everything dynamically. We were hitting some houses with surrounded call out procedures and shit like that. Uh, and so it was interesting to watch the GWAT and the transition that occurred there where, where the dudes overseas were thinking, man, this surrounded call, it may not be such a bad fucking idea um, versus DA, you know, hitting house hard and fast type of shit. So that, to me, that was a doctrinal change that the cops brought to the, to the, to the, to the soldier um, trying to do his fucking task over there. Uh, at least that's how it appeared to me. Um, because I did not see a lot of that in the early days of, of the G1. Certainly talking to dudes, friends of mine, um, as they transitioned, uh, how they were hitting houses and conducting mount and shit like that. Um, it seemed like they were adopting a lot more of the law enforcement based uh, 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 techniques. Um, the, the downside of that, of course, is like anything else. Right. And, and so I'm like, uh, you know, hey, hey fucking Pressburg and Toshima, you know, let's surround and call out this bitch because that's what the cops do. And they're like, okay, well, where's the chemical agents? Where's the robots? Where's the fucking this and that and the other bullshit? And they're like, well, can't use none of that shit over here. So you need to look at that tactic and go, okay, I, I get it makes sense in America where the coppers can slap some OC and CS on a bitch in quantity um, and maybe have some equipment at their disposal based on, you know, the, how long we had been doing shit or, whatever the fuck it is like robotics and, and drones and other bullshit. And I, I think clearly the military is the leader in the drone side of the house and, and maybe even on the robotics side, but I'm talking early in the day. Um, and, and so you start to look at that and you go, well, maybe that don't work so good. And, and I think the flip of that too, is looking at um, how I was taught Mount. Um, and, and this was, I mean, it's way back in the fucking day, right? It's 1987 ish, 88, some shit like that in Germany. Um, and, and I was taught that you would chuck a fucking hand grenade in the room and then you entered in that bitch on full auto and you sprayed to the corner and then you reloaded and clapped your sector and, you know, you, you and your mate are good and you go on the next fucking door. And I was like, well, okay, it's bitching, right? But if I can't throw the fucking grenade and I can't include that auto fire to my corner, is this still a sound technique? And the answer is maybe it is. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying when you start peeling away certain things, um, but we keep doing the same shit, right? So I'm restric restricting what you can do now, which is, I think, what's going on in America with, with law enforcement, right? They're, we're being told you can't do X, Y, and Z, but then we're, they want us to do the job the same way. And, and sometimes those two things don't jive and we're not nimble enough to look at and go, okay, well, that's, you say I can't do these things. That's what made that a safe and reasonable technique was, it, was the addition of those shits. Now you've taken those things the fuck away we need to come up with a new way to accomplish this task or not do it at all. If that's what you want as citizens, I mean, I'm subservient to you. Um, so, I, you know, Washington state is a, is a good example of legislators getting involved in some stupid shit, right? Our, our current police reform law says no, no law enforcement officer may use any military weapon uh, in the performance of their duties. And they defined a military weapon as anything over 50 cal. So all 12 gauge shotguns in Washington and all 40 millimeter less lethal launchers had to be turned the fuck in because they're over fucking 50 cal. So that's an excellent law, legislators, but, but you've tied our hands in a way that you didn't intend to because you're too fucking stupid to ask motherfuckers that, that you, how is this going to impact you and really what do you want, right? I don't think there's any liberal um, cocksucker in Washington state that doesn't want cops to have the ability to thump a dude with, with 40 millimeter or less lethal so that he doesn't have to be killed or give him an opportunity to not be killed, um, but, but that's what they fucking wrote. So sometimes unintended consequences just based on how we write shit or do crap without thinking about, you know, I got success, operational success using this then, but things have changed, right? And we're still trying to force some shit down, uh, down people's throats. And I'm, I guess I'm Ken now, I'm blathering on, on some shit, starting to get fired up a little bit, but I, I don't know. I mean, I guess food for thought for some of the shit, maybe that sparks something, somebody to jump in and, and say something else. It all ties together. Come on, Chuck. Dazzle us. Uh, I got 
I got nothing. Every everybody's dropping these knowledge bombs tonight. I mean, except for when Blower's like totally throwing people under the bus or about throwing people out windows. It's like, hey man, I'm right here. I'm on. I'm actually on the podcast with you, man. Come on. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But you know, a lot of times restrictions and equipment and stuff lead to lead to innovation. Some of that innovation is good. Some of it's not good. You know, you, we learn, especially like the Marine Corps culture, uh, you know, they, they learn to adapt to not having the same toys as, as everybody else. Um, there was an element uh, that they didn't have robots. So they, they started carrying bicycle helmets, like 10 speed bicycle helmets with a dog camera mounted on the top and speakers on the inside. And they would, after a surrounding call out, they would take the head woman of that house and put the bike helmet on her and make her go back into her house and open up all the closets and like sweep through. And they had the speakers on there. So if she like went in and kind of short stroked the room or whatever, they'd be like, stop woman face to your left. And her husband would be there in the corner and shit. And it was legit until like some lawyer was like, that's a civilian they're supposed to be protected i'm like it's their house if there's some nasty shady shit in their house like i'm literally telling the civilian go back to your home not me this other organization um that uh i that i make a lot of fun of but i had to give them a hat tip on that one and i was like why bike helmets they're like man they're all like small and like that's even less weight and bulk than a hockey helmet i gotta carry this thing on the back of a plate carrier till whenever and so they found the lightest most low profile deal and uh they chin strap little girl up and sent her, sent her back in the house before the dog before the iraqis like going there back through the house and that that was an, an amazing evolution of uh ttps and at the time they they literally thought they were not outside of the lines. And until somebody called them on it, it's like, yeah, what if, what if they go back in there and then the house blows up or whatever you sent a civilian in, into that, you gave them orders. And essentially they were in your custody, the whole five S's safeguard at the rear, blah, blah, blah. And it was kind of like, ah, uh, all right, I guess you got us. And so had to come up with another, another TCP after that, but. They got an A for effort. Kurt, does your agency That's, do that? Uh, no. Okay. Well, because my agency now is State Department, and it, you guys think police in the U.S. are soft and warm and fuzzy. You you have to see the State Department in action. They're they're the, the kindest, gentlest people ever. The, I, I just came back from a country in Africa teaching the local police that guard our embassy. And so teaching them, if there's a terrorist attack on the embassy, how do they respond? It's like, well, I can't say kill. I can't say violence. I can't say like all all of the words that you would describe to, you know, counter an attack. I can't use those words because they're not state department approved. I I see Bill just loves that. So we've talked about uh, some of the evolution of tactics and doctrine. What else you guys got on this? I know Ian has books and books. I, I, I sent all my books to Chuck Pressburg, like in a whole big package one day. <laughs> the, what, the, one of the things that interested me from the beginning of this is the, the interaction of how like from the military side, because that's what I'm familiar with, how the, the interaction of TTMP from using units, how does that bleed up to doctrine and how does doctrine bleed down to what the units do? And, and I, like, I'm familiar with that from the military side, but like for you and Bill, I'm, I'm really curious of how that, what, what is your equivalent of doctrine? The, I, I, I assume laws or your case law, either case law or department procedure. But when, when you find a, a better way to get the, to accomplish something, how do you get that changed? 
Well, uh, the one thing that uh, that really uh, stands out in my mind right now is our department's change in how to deal with people with mental issues, especially when they're suicidal. And so the old way was, okay, we go, we surround, we go respond and guns and all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, it's not that because we don't want to be the backstops. We don't want the public to be the backstops. We don't want to be shooting when we don't need to shoot. Suicide isn't, uh, is not illegal. So I, th I think it took some, some smart people to figure that out. And eventually the, the, our, our, standard operating procedure was, okay, if we have a suicidal person, they have a weapon, no one else is potentially going to be harmed. Let them do what they're going to do. We'll try to call. We have other resources that can try to call, um, but we're not going to respond in person. We're not going to go lights and siren. We're not going to try to contact them directly. Um, and that whole change in mindset to me was huge. It was awesome. It was I remember my first day back as a full-timer back in 18, uh, we were getting dispatched to a suicidal dude. Family had been gone. Uh, wife called us in and we were establishing this plan of attack. And the sergeant called and said, stand down. We're not going into that. I'm like, thank you. That makes so much more sense. This is the way it needs to be done. Um, so I think it was, I think it was uh, calm, cool heads, help change our, our way of doing things. And then other agencies seem to be doing the same thing. And we picked up more resources on the way, but it was, it was just uh, keeping the public in mind, keeping the safety of the officers in mind. And it, uh, it was a very positive change. I thought it was junk. I still do. You think it's junk? It's liability driven like a motherfucker. It's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I am I am not in my in my right mind. I am armed with a firearm. I'm not just, I'm going to take a pill, right? I'm not going to eat all the fucking Advil in the house and kill myself. But I'm armed with a firearm, I'm threatening to kill my fucking self. And it, it, to me, that is absolutely a police fucking call for service because a suicidal dude can be and has been. They have been su or homicidal in the past. And so the, if throwing the addition of the firearm, who the fuck else is equipped to manage that problem? What other public entity is bringing the tools to manage that problem if the dude decides to become homicidal? Uh, and I know there's a shit bird out of Florida, some fucking attorney running around the, the country telling coppers and administrators mainly uh, that is some shit we made up. And th those two things do not go hand in hand. And we know that's bullshit because Klebold and Harris went to Columbine High School with a suicide note left behind. And they intended to kill themselves after they were done killing a bunch of motherfuckers. And that's exactly what the fuck they did. So prove positive that some suicidal motherfuckers are indeed homicidal. Um, and, and quite frankly, I think that we are absolutely now potentially the way that we were handling those um, could have been the problem, right? If you're just kicking the fucking door down to go in there and snatch the dude, uh, the confrontation then that, that ensues. And, and now yes. we are getting suicidal dudes shot by the cops. And, and our thing was, well, fuck, we were trying to save their life. And we had to shoot them, though. You know what I mean? Those, those yeah. two things don't jibe well with some of the public. So then then the answer becomes to me, the answer is we still respond to the bitch, but you have to have enough motherfuckers on duty to be able to hold that fucking, that scene long enough for MHPs to arrive for you to get into your pocket with more resources than just kicking the fucking door down. But unfortunately in America, every goddamn police department works off of minimum staffing and those calls to keep stacking up in the fucking CAD. So our initial response was, well, fuck man, there's all kinds of shit going on. My mates are getting their asses kicked uh, on the road with calls for service and I'm here fucking around this dude. So I guess what's about to happen right now is, Hey, Chuck, me and you're going to boot the door and go see what's up with this motherfucker. We're going to make gonna, it quick. We're going to get him in custody and send him off to the hospital, uh, you know, with his 72 hour commit, or we're, we're going to, we're going to solve this bitch one way or the other. Right. And so you end up with cops shooting some fucking, uh, some dudes. And then of course there's the public outcry and this and that, and the liability that goes along with that with civil suits and this and that. And the next thing you know, Oh my God, it's all the cops fault. And we were causing this issue and this and that where well, we may have been causing it with, with poor tactics, um, but our response to it is we're the only show in town that can respond to it. And I'm watching the state's a great example of that right now. You, you, coppers will not fucking manage uh, mentally disturbed people um, and without an MHP on scene, right? They're calling MHPs first. Well, you know how that's going already. The MHP gets called. They arrive close to the scene, not to the scene. And then they call 911 and say, hey, we need some cops to go with us on this thing. Well, what the fuck? That's your job now. Well, it says he's got a knife. 
yeah, no shit. Right. So what the fuck you want us to do about it? Well, come with us. We're still dealing with the same bullshit. Right. The answer to this is copious amounts of chemical agent and drive that cocksucker rather we can thumb him with fucking less lethal and then choke him the fuck out. So he can't harm himself or others and then get him to the fucking hospital. But all that shit looks bad. And so now we're, we're dictating fucking law enforcement policy based on, on public opinion. And, and the problem with that, by banning chokeholds was the dumbest fucking thing this state ever did. If you want me to not hurt m- mentally ill motherfuckers, then choking them the fuck out is the way to do it. Right. Their ass goes to sleep. Now they're in fucking handcuffs and we're good. Are some people going to die from that? Yes. Is it a direct result of the chokehold? Maybe if it was administered improperly or maybe there was already an underlying medical condition and the, and the chokehold exasperated that and they die. But the vast majority of them are going to have no other ill effects other than waking up in handcuffs. What the fuck just happened to me? And hey, fella, you're going to the hospital for 72 hours on an involuntary commit. But but. But here we go. Right. Uh, Public opinion and video and this and that. And, you know, the shocking view that violence is to some people who haven't ever seen a motherfucker air hole slap a bitch. Uh, All of a sudden now they're dictating policy, man. And, And that is the policing that you're getting in America today which I guess is the national doctrine, right? It's the, the doctrine of public opinion versus the professional. Um, and anybody that's been a cop for a minute in, in a half-ass busy town knows some motherfuckers just need a good swift kick in the dick to solve the problem. And that's it. And that's all, man. And if you don't like looking at it, then you should stop fucking watching TV. So I disagree with you, Matt. I think it is a fucking law enforcement problem. How do you really feel? I just told you. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, no, no, no. So my my uh, chief came fought the fuck out, right? And he said, hey, this was, of course, prior to all the police reform shit. But, this, you know, it was like, what, by statute, can we detain this motherfucker? And the answer is yes, right? There was a Washington state statute uh, that allows me to take a mentally disturbed person who, who is threatened to commit suicide into protective custody. If, as an example, they try to jump off a bridge, right? That's, that's, that's how I encounter them. I'm going to jump off this fucking bridge and kill myself. I can use force to prevent them from jumping off the bridge. Right. And so if you extrapolate that, then a dude in his house with a firearm, I can use force to get him to come out where it's safer for me and safer for him to take him into custody. That force would obviously be chemical agent. So let's fill this fucking house up and force him out of the goddamn house. If that don't work, then the next thing would be introducing canine and all of the other bullshit that goes the fuck along with it. Right. But that's not what's happening, right? It, 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 it has become a thing um, where the cops are just killing crazy people, even though the, the catalyst for that case in Washington was a crazy lady that called the cops herself. When they showed up, she charged them with a butcher knife. They shot her ass, but it's the cops' fault. I mean, who, 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 what kind of a moron comes up with this bullshit? And, and I, we might be fucking getting way away from tactics and, and changes in procedure, but I, this is I guess not because it is, it is a change in procedure for, for Washington state law enforcement, man. And, I, and it's not atypical from shit around the fucking country, right? There is a bunch of shit that is liability driven by chiefs of police and it has nothing to do with anything other than they don't like it. And that's as simple as that. Dynamic warrant service is one of those things, right? The NTA came out with that bullshit back in 2000 preaching about how dangerous it is, but the facts do not, do not support that assertion, man. They just don't. So what is driving it? The only thing that can be driving it is we obviously there's been opportunity for more dogs to get killed when I'm serving a warrant dynamically than when I'm not. Everybody loves a fucking dog. And so that is now a liability driven thing. The confrontation that is ensuing because of it and not like, like we said at the beginning, a SWAT doesn't always mean the same shit. So a poorly trained team that is conducting that technique improperly has a bad outcome. And now it's the technique's fault. And it ain't the technique's fault. It's your shitty fucking fault for not doing the motherfucker right. It has nothing to do with the technique, man. That's like me saying I crashed my car. It's your shitty driving is why you crashed the car. It had nothing to do with the car you were driving, motherfucker. I mean, it's just stupid shit sometimes that drives some of these fucking things across the country. And I mean, it's just it's just absolutely fucking silly. And maybe that's a difference between law enforcement and the military is that the doctrine at least is being driven by professionals at a higher level that have lived some of this shit. And know what the fucking soldier needs to be able to accomplish this task in America. That is not the case. The, the ch- political chief is the motherfucker cowing down to, to city councils, county councils and, and the public and, and enacting stupid fucking shit so they can maintain their job. So, uh, Bill, so you're going to tell me the pull out of Afghanistan was a well-managed professional decision. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm trying to speak. I'm speaking from a position of arrogance. Can I was it uh, not a career military man? So I'll let, I'll, I'll let you guys talk about that shit. Well, to me, it looked like a fucking goat rodeo is what it looked like. But I, I don't have any skin in the game. The is, and the question was, where does this stuff get driven from? Right. And, and unfortunately, as you know, 
some of the people that end up driving these things have no business driving these. They have a right. political career uh, perspective on things, and then you got operators that are just they're mission oriented. They just want to get it done right. right. And where two worlds collide, I, I knew uh, right away when I was at Naval Special Warfare. I was actually uh, at SEAL Team One. And I was in the armory, XO comes in and says, hey, what's up, you know, what's going on? And we had these literally Model 70 sniper rifles from Vietnam. They were all shot up, no, nothing worked. And I, we essentially in the early or uh, late 70s, early 80s, had no sniping program in Naval Special Warfare, none. It just didn't exist, it just disappeared. There wasn't any reason for it. We weren't fighting anybody. I actually ended up writing a bunch of doctrine and requests and you know, requests for 50 caliber sniper rifles, you name it, blah, 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 because I'm just an enlisted guy trying to do the right thing. Um, and anyway, that got shot up to, uh, you know, we, we run things by uh, various, um, you know, the Naval Special Warfare is written by procedures as well. But anyway, people take it, they write themselves Navy comms, you know, they alter them to their benefit. You know, they get rank, they get medals. So it's the same thing in the military. Let's just face it. Uh, and so you're fighting that upper level of stupidity, absolute absurdity when it comes to doctrine. And I, you know, I get right back to, does it work? You know, and that's what, what, what operators end up asking themselves. Well, does it work? And, and, and that's my, my, my thing with people not understanding the difference between doctrine and like a technique that you are going to use to accomplish something within right. the doctrine. Right. And, and I, I guarded a general who was a, a task force commander. He started every briefing when the special operations teams would brief him that I'm a pilot. I don't know anything about this, but I'm a general and they put me in charge. I've read your books. So start your briefing invariably they'd get through a briefing and so he'd stop them and say, Hey, uh, you're not following your own doctrine. Like you're, what you're doing doesn't fit what your doctrine is. So can you explain that to me? Cause I'm a pilot and I don't know. And we'd leave and he'd say, how, how do these guys not know what they're supposed to do? Right. It's like, cause nobody reads the doctrine manual. Nobody understands that difference of, What's the difference between the doctrine and the technique that you want to use? How, how do you tie those together? Yep. There's, there's the, uh, there's the dilemma you know, as it unfolds. So um, I think, you know, again, I, 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 I was fortunate enough to kind of straddle between both worlds. Uh, I'm kind of maybe the uh, oddity here. I maybe some of you guys still do commercial stuff, but you know, as a commercial guy, I can just say, here's my doctrine. You know, I write the doctrine and it's your job to dovetail it in, whether it fits with, you know, does it fit with your doctrine? Can you rewrite it in a way to say happy instead of glad, you know, uh, and so it still fits your document. You know, it was never mine. So I've always felt for the guys that have to suffer under bad doctrine, knowing it doesn't work. That doesn't mean you can't, you shouldn't try to change it. But again, back to everybody's point, you have to know what it is. You have to be fluent in it. You have to understand where it came from and uh, what you're dealing with to change, to actually change it. Or you're just, you're just flying as a rogue. And sometimes that's what you're going to do anyway. Yep. You know, I'm sure throwing people out windows didn't fit anybody's doctrine per se, <laughs> you know, back to that, but you know, stuff happens. We know it. And, uh, Anyway, you know, enough said. It's just it's a constant struggle for the guys that have some basic common sense, and sometimes those things don't fit. The, the other analogy I'll use is, you know, maybe um, again, mar I, I, martial arts. You know, you get these schools, uh, whatever, you know, whatever the school is, you know, jujitsu, whatever. There's a whole bunch of doctrine, and they can't see outside of their own doctrine. I mean, it may be a cool martial art, it may be badass in and of itself, but it it's been my experience, all of them have limitations. And um, you just got to understand what's driving. I can ask most guys that are BJJ guys, for example, because again, that's the flavor of the year. I say, tell me what the basic uh, strategy, you know, not the dog, what's the basic strategy of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? 
And these guys have been doing it for years. They can't even articulate what the basic strategy, what they're trying to do, because all they've done is monkey see, monkey do. Uh, you know, they know, uh, you know, they can talk to you all day long about the nuances of how to guy, you know, get a guy in a, you know, a rear naked choke, this, that, get to this position, arm bars, whatever. But they, they actually themselves could be high, quote unquote, high level guys that I wouldn't want to mess with. Uh, but they don't even know the strategy of what they're doing. And, and I go, well, you know, that strategy doesn't fit into this situation when there's 10 of us wearing body armor, rifles, pistols, chemicals, uneven terrain, you know, and on and on, multiple adversaries that may be armed. Your strategy doesn't fit here. And they're totally convinced because they can choke a dude out on a mat that they're, and I don't want to get into big, you know, to da on this stuff, but, you know, that's the point. I, I love playing around on the ground, but I know where it fits in, into the entire right. doctrine of what I'm trying to do. So, so that's 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 a technique that that works under a certain set of circumstances, but it, it's not a strategy. You know, getting a guy into a rear naked choke, yeah, you you may be able to do that under certain circumstances, but knocking him out is, I, I don't know, Ian, Ian, am I right with the the definitions of of how it changes from technique to strategy to doctrine the so I, i'm not a strategy guy so let's be very clear about that otherwise i wouldn't be in a motel room hotel room <laughs> it bed. so i've got my strategy all messed up but broadly uh principles term symbols tactics techniques procedures are are these main elements within army doctrine so uh doctrine is just this umbrella term for all these different aspects to it um and um, so it's all doctrine. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question because I'm getting old and feeble-minded. But I will <laughs> also say that, uh, and I need to leave soon. So last, last comment is, um, second to the last comment is regarding doctrine in the Army anyway that folks don't agree with. So you, all you soldiers out there, Guard, Reserve, Active folks, you own the doctrine. There is a feedback mechanism in play in the front of every one of these books for you to provide feedback. Yes. Point out what you think is wrong. Point out what you think it should be and why. And then every so often, these documents come up for review, and either the changes are they're, they're all discussed, and they're mandated to look at all these feedback forms. So look at it. Uh, they'll, they'll look at it. They'll, they'll staff it. They'll, they'll consider it and either discard or, or, or go with what you have to say. An example of doctrine that, that evolved in 2003 with machine guns, um, uh, there was a a, a manner of firing the gun uh, called uh, swinging traverse. And uh, it was one I of remember the that. classes of fire with respect to the gun. And it um, basically was in a tripod with this locking mechanism where the up and down was locked in place, but the left and right. Even but left, left like and right, yeah, I, I remember that. So in 2003, the uh, machine gun book uh, did away with that. So it was pared down from five classes of fire down to, or from six down to five. Uh, and then lo and behold, turns out that was a dead end and that class of fire was brought back. So it's, it's an example of just because something's not in the book doesn't make it correct. It may not disappear. It may come back. And just because it's not in there yet doesn't mean it's not right. So uh, anyway, so all you soldiers out there, you own what's in the book. And if you don't like it and you haven't given a feedback form, shut the fuck up until you do. That, that's your ticket to complain. Uh, and then the last comment is, even though you retired out of the SEAL community, your hair is still glorious. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they give you a hair kit. When you there you go. Hair. That's so but, uh, Thank you. you. You're keeping it up. You're keeping it tight, buddy. There you go. So Thanks. I need to get off. Uh, I'm, I'm down in um, Texas at Fort Sam Houston uh, doing some stuff with some folks. And um, anyway, it was nice to meet everyone virtually. Um, and put uh, voices at least uh, and faces to some of these names. Uh, Chuck, Mr. Good, uh, Mr. Bill Blowers, someone that uh, Matt forgot is a PT freak. Uh, I mentioned your name earlier and he's like, oh yeah, that guy. And then Mr. Weber. So uh, all of you, have a good night. Matt, thank you for inviting me and uh, everyone stay safe. Thank you all. Anytime. Bye now. I think to, to both Ian and, uh, and Ken's last point, man. And that, so around 2000, 
fuck off. I know the 12 ish, 13, some shit like that as a team, uh, we came up not for, not for every knucklehead, right. Not for every dude that stood there type of shit, but for the dude that really wanted to fucking fight us, um, on, on an entry, that fucker was going to sleep. That was that, I guess that would be what I would call a doctrine. So if you are, if we were opposed physically by a guy, um, then we were going to put him the fuck out. Right. So within that, obviously we're, I mean, we're using cop, cop land, fucking chokeholds and, and shit like that. Um, but what we ended up discovering and training was that um, outside of what the normal BJJ man would consider the ultimate sin in the team setting, uh, me and Chuck enter a room together as an example. And I end up in the corner, the dude's got his dukes up. Right. So I wade into him and try to get after his ass. Uh, and he happens to be just one of those dudes. He's physically stronger than me. He's younger than me. Uh, he's been trained in the, in, in the jailhouse. He's a street fighter. I mean, he's got all this shit going for him here. Um, and I start to believe he, this dude is going to be a handful. Um, what we ended up deciding was the best course of action was I would pull that fucker into guard. So I'm going to intentionally yep. give him topside. And then Chuck's going to pull his fucking K pot off and beat the ever living fuck out of that dude because there's all of his meat is now sitting on top of me and exposed or Chuck could wait in and now be choking that dude out versus if I was trying to maintain the fight. Now, doctrinally, if you go to BJJ at all, they'd be like, bro, you fucking high, man. You don't, you don't, you don't do that shit. Right. Um, we were concerned. Okay. Well, on this, in the team setting, that may be sound doctrine, but now I'm a singleton on patrol and, and do I forget where I'm at? And all of a sudden I'm, oops, fuck me. I didn't mean to do that shit. Right. And I pulled this guy into my own guard. And, and my response was, dude, that's, we're not, we're not dumb fucks. Right. I mean, this, we, I understand the difference between a team setting and when I'm a singleton on patrol uh, and how that fight would, would, would not be very effective for me in that role. Uh, and so, I mean, it, it worked out dynamite in training. I can't, I, I can't tell you of an incident where um, I pulled a dude into guard and, and then my mates were able to come in there and, and you know, it was just a, a tornado with fists and feet coming out of it, stomping this dude's ass, but it was working like a motherfucker every time we put on the hit suit. Um, so I believe that that is an adaptation of the BJJ shit um, that while not sound on the map in reality was working at least in the training, right? as much as we could pressure test it on the training side of the house. Uh, it was working very, very effectively um, on that shit. I mean, I, I seen it on a couple of calls. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, food stop, man. I, we, we used to bring in a new version of hand to hand, teacher every 90 days we, we would go through whatever guy was teaching whether it was bjj uh taekwondo karate kickboxing whatever he would teach for 90 days we'd bring in a new one and e every one of them it was hold up your body armor with all of your bullshit on it that you had to wear on an operation say how can i make what you do work with this with this equipment and with the BJJ, it was what, what we learned was pull a fucking dude into guard and let your teammates stop the crap out of them because I, I don't operate alone. I, I'm, dude, that's, I, I, I'm not a single thing. So you are the first fucking dude that is that has told me that I can try to convince other guys of this shit. And a lot of them, if they're particular BJJ practitioners, like, whoa, fuck no, man. And I'm like, dude, yeah, that's. Wow. That's, that's basically what, what we learned from BJJ was pull a guy into the guard and your teammates will take care of him. Yeah. Yeah. And like we did other things with uh, kendo and karate and other stuff. There was like, if I can just learn one fucking technique from whatever it is you're teaching, I'll work that into my, my overall stick. But as we look from macro to micro, so, you know, do doctrine is I'm using open, close hand techniques to, to get compliance. Now I'm fighting with a dude. My strategy is going back strategy for BJJ. He, Ken said it, but I was thinking here, what is my strategy for BJJ? 
oh, I'm going to fuck some joints up or get pain compliance, or I'm going to make a motherfucker go night-night with some type of choke. There, there it is. That's the strategy, the game plan. And I'm working on the arm, and the dude starts to feel the get, get, get on the arm, and he does something that gives me some neck. I am now changing tactics to achieve my shit because – I was going to try to get some pain compliance followed by breaking a joint if he wasn't on board, but he's now giving me this other thing. So I'm going to choke him the fuck out instead. Um, and that's just, that's the way it is. But all uh, like Ken said, all these techniques, they all have flaws. And that's why you don't hear people say I'm a jujitsu guy. I mean, yes, you do people that are in it for the purity of the sport, but everything is MMA. Uh, whereas you know, what does jujitsu get me if I'm still standing up? No, nothing. <laughs> jujitsu doesn't start until basically we're down there rolling around like grown ass men. So everything on my feet is some Same. other discipline. It's some other hybrid of, of whatever I had not seen a whole into the guard. And that was only because of, uh, objective reasonableness and the fact that you're loaded with explosives and kit and deadly weapons and knives and whatever. So hemming a dude up and being able to call and then have a lethal, a lethal, uh, cover option because you're already past threshold as opposed to domestically where just because the dudes put his hands on you doesn't mean you can contact shoot him. So now you've got to create the space to get him out of the corner, get, pull him out. And I think pulling him out and rolling him uh, and exposing him to everybody in the room that now has a split second where they're not doing work to come over there and, you know, give him the assault boot, fuck out of here, uh, you know, <laughs> love or whatever. Uh, it, it makes sense, but they're both variations on the theme. I'm now face to face with somebody. I don't want to do this by myself. So how do I get another teammate and, and turn fighting into a team sport? But a little segue going back to, um, yeah, Ian mentioned it with uh doctrine. Hey, the doctrine belongs to you. All you have to do, there's a thing you send it up to whatever. Some of you guys talking about risk aversion and, and, and whatever it goes back to, uh, in my mind, when I've talked to cops, Bill being one of them, but lots of other cops that have got some pretty janky policy. I ask where, where did this policy come from? And it, most of it boils down to, there was no policy somebody made one nobody's gone to jail and gotten any case law or sued over it and so now that becomes the easy button and so we get some ntoa dd employment best practices well who the hell wants to accept professional risk in a department where, where you're the only guy pushing for change and then somebody does five minutes of paperwork or homework uh research on the google box and they're like you recommend a policy that is in contrast to the national uh, institute, uh, agencies, association, excuse me, recommended best practices. If you have a practice that isn't the best practices, sounds to me like it's not the best. Ah, okay. You got me risk averse chief. And that that's kind of where we get this just like Xerox carbon copy passed down. And the fifth, sixth, 10th agency that copies policy might not have even understood the nuances of the regional uh, regional policing and or yes. politics that led to the initial policy that became yes. the thing right and that's that's so it gets that it's all of this goes back to uh inherent human nature and, and and laziness and not wanting to reinvent the wheel we think reinventing the wheel is bad if that fucking wheel is square reinventing that bitch is awesome you know what i mean but we just we're we're it's in our nature to go and get the sure thing uh and then make the sure thing happen where i'm at as opposed to just breaking brush getting out there and and, and making your own trail you know Man, that's a fact. I, I don't know how many team leader meetings I sat in um, on my team and we, we proposed some shit and they was, the boss would be like, well, what is well, whoever the fuck? What does L.A. do? What does Las Vegas do? What does whatever the fuck do? And my response was, them bitches are going to be calling one day and ask, what the fuck do we do? We should be fucking leading this bitch, not waiting for them motherfuckers to come online, right? Let us be the trendsetters. If it's reasonable, it's reasonable, man. Let's just do our shit. Um, and getting that whole concept 
pass a risk averse manager is a fucking task, bro. Cause they don't want nothing to do with that bunch of bullshit. Kurt, to your point, man, you asked, how does that shit happen with cops showing 2008? I was promoted to fucking police sergeant. Uh, and I, we, at my headquarters P there's an upstairs part, but there's a sergeant's area, right? It's just full of fucking cubicles and shit. And so I'm working weekend days, boring as fucking dude asked me, Hey, Hey, Sarge, what's up with this shit on the contract? Right. And I'm like, I don't fucking know the answer to your question, man. I'll go check it out and get back to you. So I go up to my desk on Sunday and I'm, my mouse had one of them wheels on it, right? You could run the wheel to scroll through <laughs> shit. And so I'm scrolling. Yep. Just like that. Right. So I'm scrolling like a motherfucker and I click by accident and I watch the cursor drop into the text. And I ain't never seen that happen before. Right. So as a new sergeant, I got new permissions to look at different fucking folders and do different shit that I wasn't allowed to do as an officer. And so I'm sitting there watching the cursor flashing inside the text of our fucking contract. And I go, what? I'm thinking, I said, what the fuck does this mean? Right. And so I, I A E D I O G B T and it fucking types in there. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no fucking way this shit's going to save. Right. I mean, it's, Something's fucked up here. And so I backspace everything because I'm also thinking it's sending a notice right now that Chief of Police Blower is fucking around, right? <laughs> and so and so I stare at this thing. I swear to God for like 20 minutes and I well, fuck it. I'm gonna put an A E C I G P somewhere in a sentence. I'm gonna hit the X button. If it asks me if I want to save, I'm gonna say fucking yes. And if this somehow reports me to IT and the chief and this bullshit, I'm just, I, I don't know how that fucking happened. I was busy scrolling shit. I must have who the fuck knows, right? <laughs> Just pretend like I didn't know the shit was happening. So I do it. So, do you like to save? Yes, I fucking would. I save it. I open it back up. My shit is actually saved. And then I go on my days off. I come back from three days of days off and I'm waiting for it to come see me email, right? Or <laughs> something. There ain't nothing, right? And so I go check the fucking shit again. And there is my AEICDP, whatever the fuck. And so I'm checking policy or SOG manual, everything. I can now... Edit as I see fit and save the motherfucker. And I had that superpower for 10 fucking years, Kurt. I know how co the fucking crooks get caught. They start bumping their gums because there was like a million <laughs> fucking times that I wanted to tell dudes, hey, man, do you know what I can do? Right. And so dumb shit would pop off and I would just go into the policy mail, change it, wait like a week and go, hey, man, we're doing this thing. And the boss would be like, we can't do that shit. And I go, it's in policy. Fuck. I'm like, when the fuck did that change? I'm like, I don't know. It's always been like that, bro. I don't know what the fuck to tell you, man. So that's how shit gets changed at, at my level. It was 10 years of just IT fucking up and giving me permission to do shit in that crap that I wasn't supposed to have. That's awesome. Wow. I, I, I wanted to ask Matt also, uh, your re reaction to suicide policy, was that a bottom up or a top down decision? I think it was meet in the middle. I mean, some, somebody had to decide we're going, going to change. Mm -hmm. Well, it went from, I think it was the sergeant at the time said, this is what's going to happen. The, though, to that. It was, national, it was national push for that shit. Okay. Yeah. I, I remember that from way back. I mean, I, you know, that, that shit started to pop Oh, no, we, off. Were, we were still responding and knocking on doors and all that kind of stuff up until then. That being yeah. said, though. Yeah, right. But I'm saying that shit, that shit was moving across the country as a as the thing to do. Right. Just don't go. And, and we actually got to bring as, as long as I mean, we were told by our city attorney that if we go, then we have a duty to do something. We can't just pack it up and leave. So his suggestion was, I don't either don't go at all. Just type code that shit out where you, you ain't going to that call. Or if you do go then the dudes that should respond to that call would be the SWAT team because they're a ready-made force. They got better equipment yeah. for all weather conditions. You have a logistics training already set up, this, that, everything, versus the poor patrol bastard that's standing out there, you know, in December, raining like a motherfucker up here in Seattle. He's, all he's been issued is a raincoat, for fuck's sake, right? Um, and so he's a, if you go that route, I, that's, I, that's fine. He goes, but you can't approach it the same way you would as a barricaded robbery suspect where we just go to work on a motherfucker right now. Yep. He yep. said, you're going to have to wait longer, bring in some of these extra resources and do everything you can to, to try to limit the confrontation piece as much as possible, including yep. if, if the guy hasn't taken his meds and now he pops him, give him, give the meds the time to fucking work. Uh, and, and so, I mean, my chief came out and he said, if, there, if it's a suicidal guy and he has a, and it is verified, he has a firearm, then we're not leaving that, that will, that is a call we will go to. And that was in place until I retired in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't think they're, I know they're not doing it now with police reform They're because they can't. Uh, it's, I mean, that's just no longer a police action, right? So uh, MHP would get the call on that and they would go out and try to deal with this motherfucker. But of course, like I said, what they're doing is calling the cops. The guy has a firearm. I, I'm not yeah. going to go up there and knock on the fucking door. Well, what do you want us to do then? Well, I guess you guys could surround it and ask them, what the fuck? We're doing the same shit. The only thing we've added is that you are now responding, which I guess is a bonus, right? The MHP actually is coming to the scene versus trying to get a hold of one at one o'clock in the goddamn morning somewhere. Um, but I mean, that was being pushed across the board. I mean, the, the push for it was obvious, right? There were suicidal dudes that were getting filled in by coppers going in there because they point a gun at the cops and the cops would fucking shoot them. Well, that. Who the fuck thinks that's unreasonable, right? I, I didn't. If the guy didn't want to point a gun at me. We wouldn't. I wouldn't have shot his ass, type of shit. Um, but but yeah, that's that. That's the shit, man. Um, it is the same bullshit from ICP or whatever national level thing, like Chuck was talking about. They they get their their panties in a bind, or it is a dollar sign liability issue as the head of agency that is allowing their cops to do a certain thing, and all of a sudden we end up with restrictive policy because that head of agency doesn't want to support it. And then you get a bunch of motherfuckers that are all in the same group as head of agencies. They all start talking and influencing each other and saying, this is a really bad idea, but the proof isn't necessarily in the fucking pudding, right? If you look at it statistically, how many suicidal armed people were absolutely saved by police intervention and taken to the hospital with no issue whatsoever, other than the phone call inside to say, Hey buddy, can we, you know, we're here to help you. Uh, and you talk to the fellow for a couple minutes, they come right out. I mean, I've, I've done that dozens of times oh, yeah. in my career. Yeah. Right. And, and all of a sudden, Hey man, you're, I'm going to involuntary commit. You're going to go to the hospital for 72 hours, blah, 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 blah. And off they fucking go. They get their meds. They talk to an MHP, this and that compared to the number of times that a suicidal guy was shot. And if, if it's a million saves and one dude got shot, then, then that is not a bad program. That's man. a good program. Yeah. yeah. Right. But, so, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm, I don't know what the exact fucking numbers are, yeah. but I would bet you nationally the number of suicidal people with firearms with police intervention that got the help they needed so that they were, they no don't want to, they don't want to shoot cops. They don't no. want to shoot him there. They're, they're, no, I mean, they're, no. No, there's no pride in that. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. not like, yeah, I don't want to shoot a crazy guy. I mean, that, that ain't a fucking yeah. cool one. Yeah. That, that sucks, man. Right. That, I mean, that's just shitty. Um, but we don't, but we don't pull the stats on how many times we intervene and help the motherfucker versus yep. the one time a dude got shot. Yep. And if you look at that on the national level, statistically, everybody would be like, that's it. Like, are we, are we talking like a my, and I don't know. Right? It's I'm, true. I'm guessing 0.05% of the time we shoot yeah. the motherfucker. I mean, fuck, bro. That that's not a bad program, man. I get it. Well, I don't want no one to die. I, I get it, right? I understand that concept, but you, th- this this world ain't that, man. That's called utopia. Shit, bad shit's gonna happen sometimes. So I really get the distinct feeling that Utah is about five years behind everything, including that. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Um, what our our current SOP? I don't even think it's SOP. Our, yeah, basically, what what we're encouraging people to do is when we get those calls. We contact mental health. We're not handing it over to mental health. We're still primary, but if they're able to talk the people down, okay, we're going to, well, they're going to, the, with those mental health people won't respond on scene. We will. And if they're going to get transported, we will be on scene to, to assist any way we can. Um, and then it may, it may wind up resulting in them going voluntarily to the hospital, either their own power or an ambulance comes and picks them up that they agree that they'll be transported. Um, but it's nice with the additional resources because it's not just us calling and saying, Hey dude, uh, what's going on? Don't kill yourself. Uh, how about the Mets? Now it's mental health professionals calling saying, Hey, what, what's going on? How can we help? And they wind up doing so much more and, and it seems so much more positive when they're involved. And it's, it's just wonderful to have that resource. I'm also kind of, kind, of, kind of curious uh, from the police side, like from, from the military side or, or specifically from my side, from uh, being in the SIF and SF, like our, our doctrine was driven by an, an outside agency. I didn't have any control over that. But TTMP, we, we met frequently to go over what was I, I, I guess NTOA term best practice to see what was working and, and how that, how we fit that into what the doctrine was. Cause like, you know, doctrine for us, for CQB was multiple entry, you know, can confuse the bad guys with entry from as many positions as you could. 
okay, so how do we fit strategy tactics and all of those other things into that? And when something isn't working, how do we change it? How, how does that work for police? I, I, Cause I'm, I'm still like for, for you guys, this, for me, this is the most fascinating part is hear you guys talk about how that worked for you guys. So for us, we recently had a change in the way we do felony stops. And it all, the, it all changed when a couple of the instructors attended Will Petty's vehicle shooting vehicles class. And they changed it up as opposed to, we're not going to, we're not going to sit at the, uh, uh, we're not going to sit at the, what, what do you call it? At the, at the front of the vehicle's, behind our doors and calling people out that way. We're going to go to the rear of the vehicle. Pillar. Yes. Yes. Now what we're going to do is we're going to the rear of the vehicle and we're going to do commands from there. And, and some of the agencies are looking at having their PA systems linked up to the rear of their vehicle, have the PA in the trunk or they're an SUV in the back. And so basically I think what happened is these agencies, these officers saw, Hey, this is this can be a safer way of doing things. Here's what we're seeing. Here's a different way of doing it. Try it out. If you like it, do it. And that's what they did. And so they, they genuinely saw there was a, they, they weighed it and determined it was better. And you are, right now in your cop car, does you, do you guys have the control boxes where you can um, list, monitor your radio traffic over the PA you flip the switch and it starts whatever you broadcast it. That's already going on. Right. Yeah. So, all you, you don't need to do nothing from the fucking trunk at a switch in the goddamn thing or a microphone. Just flip that fucking switch and then you talk over your radio, which broadcasts out of the PA to the dude. This shit has been around since fucking 1992. All right. So it, it, it's sometimes you just got <laughs> what the fuck, man? What the fuck, right? And, and so here, this thinking is, is hard. Oh, this goes back to Ken's shit, I think, to some degree, right? So now it's, well, let's do this thing. And, and who, it doesn't matter who the fuck's teaching the cock sucking shit, right? It's, there ain't nothing new out there. But this is our new fucking doctor, man. We're going to do everything from the back of the motherfucking car, blah, 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 blah. But now how about when you get the blue hair who's confused, right? She thought her goddamn car was stolen, reported the motherfucker stolen, and then found the car the next morning right in the goddamn garage and forgot she reported the bitch stolen. So now she's driving around going to get her groceries and her bullshit. A any cop worth his salt would but what the fuck something ain't right here right when's the last time you saw an 85 year old woman steal the fucking car and then you light her up and she pulls right the fuck over you're gonna run back to the back of the car now you see what I'm saying? <laughs> oh absolutely here where you have to say man this oh, is, yeah. this is doesn't oh, yeah. make fucking sense and so you teach all of these things for different circumstances man you can't say doctor this is how we will always do it that that's what got us in trouble with dynamic warrant service was teams were using only dynamic warrant service for everything under the fucking sun and there's a time when you got to say hey man we we need more than one plan for this shit but i think a chunk of this but on at least on the law enforcement side is it's hard to get the training time yes to, to let guys see that shit and and more importantly i guess recognize when it's time to use the a pillar and when it's time to use the back of the fucking yeah. car, man. Be yeah. smart. You know I mean? Yeah. And some of this shit too, man, it's it, the statistics that get bantered the fuck about 80, 88% of the time, the cop gets killed with an a pillar. Okay. So what does that mean though? What does that mean? How many felony stops were cops killed in America in 2020? Two. So 88% of two is what? That is not a fucking bad statistic when you consider a million fucking felony stops got done in 2000 goddamn 20 in America, for fuck's sake, right? We're wearing guns and body armor. Somebody's going to get shot up in this bitch occasionally, right? Ain't nothing you can do about the shit. So, but we skew shit and we, we turn things to fuck around and then it becomes an influence that it really shouldn't be, that shouldn't be allowed to be influenced. But yeah, you know, well, that that ultimately no, is going to fall on the the initial officer responding to make that determination, and hopefully they're smart enough to recognize. But you know that that is not always true. It's man. not always you, true. You've seen dudes escalate oh, absolutely. because of absolutely. lack of training or what yes. I call fear biting. Right? They're they're they, they either lack the experience or the training necessary to to do the thing that's sitting in yeah. front of them. And as a result, they fucking fear by just like a dog backed into a corner. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting a motherfucker hit over the head with a flashlight when what all he had to do was talk to the dude for another 30 fucking seconds. But he hasn't figured that part out yet. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not saying I'm not saying that as the guy that always had to figure it out, I did my own share of that shit coming the fuck up. You know what I mean? Everybody has to go through that, that process. So you get the wrong guy or you get the right guy that, who is well-trained and 
can actually whoop motherfuckers ass, but he lacks reasonableness. He's just as bad as the untrained dickhead that don't know no better. Yeah. Probably worse even. Right. I, I mean, sitting on George Floyd's neck for nine and a half minutes was fucking stupid. I mean, that guy was a moron. I'm not even saying sitting on his neck is a bad fucking thing in and of itself. But for that duration, he was just being a hard headed dickhead. I'm not saying he's a murderer. I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm just saying that is a dumb fucking move for nine and a half minutes. It wasn't working. So move on to something fuck else, man. It's just stupidity like that. That puts us in the binds that we are in, yep. in law enforcement. Absolutely. I got to say, though, you coming from a suburb of Chicago, Chicago, Seattle, and saying there's a blue hair. That could have been anything. <laughs> I'm saying. I get it now. It's a, it's a, like an emo or something you're talking about. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> like an, an emo. An emo. <laughs> <laughs> an emo. That's something else. Yeah. Or an emo. Like one of those emo oh. kids. I got you. It's like, it's like a skateboard kid from Capitol Hill or some shit. All right. All right. I, I, I got to go to bed. I'm, I'm sorry. I've been I don't blame you. How many like continents have you hours. been in? Yeah. Uh, Just Three. today? Yeah. Uh, Kurt, hey, Kurt, man, the short answer to your question is it d- depends on the agency. How? Yep. Because my chief ultimately has the authority to do anything he wants with our police department, as long as it's within case law, but nothing in the state guides him to do anything in Washington. So there are other states where that may be the case. Uh, I was very fortunate as a training master manager. My chief trusted me and he gave me autonomy to run the unit as I saw fit. And so we could change how we were conducting business at the drop of a fucking hat. Yep. I mean, literally, Kurt Weber comes to me and says, hey, man, I don't know if you noticed, but in whatever the fuck, Texas, this thing happened. We should really be teaching our guys how to do this. I'd be like, cool, man, you're on the hook for fucking block A next year. You got six hours or seven or whatever the fuck it is to introduce this thing or teach it to a proficiency or whatever the fuck. And I could just make those decisions on my own. Yep. Super. I was very, very fortunate because a lot of police departments are not like that, man. That's good. All right. Have, have a good night, everybody. Bye, Thanks, Kurt. Kurt. I'll well, tell you another that, one, since we got yeah, here. Yeah. Here, here is a thing, right, that that um, I guess is maybe maybe tactics, maybe techniques. For me, techniques almost always include a piece of equipment, so uh, I, it may fall into that, at least as far as my definition goes. And that is uh, the current state of it. I think there's some context missing with cur- the current state of lights. Um, and so I'm seeing, a, you know, a, a, I need a jillion candela to do my to, to be the best. Ever. If you don't got that, then then you're killed in the streets type of shit. Uh, and I think the context needs to be there because I, I currently know, know a dude who is constantly fucking deploying and he's deploying with 300 fucking lumens of white light. So shut the fuck up because he doesn't need 50,000 candela and yet he's out slaying this country's fucking enemies all the goddamn time in all different continents of the fucking world. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes I look at that shit and dudes just start getting these stupid fucking arguments uh, and, and it, it drives me bug shit. I mean, I, there, there has to be I think maybe that I shouldn't say it has to be. We should be defining, right? That I want a 50,000 candela light in these specific circumstances. Yes. Does that makes yes, sense. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the the new surefire scout fucking mini, whatever the fuck the thing is called. I don't remember what the shit is, but it's a it's a double, a triple A, I think, flashlight. Yeah. Super, super lightweight, very it sounds very like a state light. department thing. So who the, exactly yeah. motherfuckers are, you know, that thing pops out. I don't have a fucking use for the cocksucker, but do you think maybe Surefire did their research and somebody wants that fucking thing in quantities enough that made it worth fucking building? And the answer is, of course, dumb shit. So don't clown on the motherfucker just because you can't use it or don't mm-hmm. wouldn't use it. Right. I mean, there, there's just a bunch of shit like that that sometimes is infuriating with motherfuckers. It's like they like they live in a fucking bubble where they only hunt hogs under white light. I mean, it's no, they, they're stupid. just on the Internet. They're just on the Internet. They're just collecting information that they can hold over others. What What's the uh, what, what the hell endpoint is it? The five that takes a double A. That was a yeah, State yeah. Department thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. So shut At the fuck up. It was. Yeah. Why the fuck would I comment in any derogatory fashion on something that I ha- it doesn't suit me? But I, clearly somebody's using that motherfucker for some shit. So well, my job is to shut the fuck up, right? And just mind my own goddamn P's and Q's, man. So I just posted on Instagram this nice little 1911. No light, it. no optic. <laughs> seven round magazine, 45 Horrible. ACP. Killed yeah. in the str- streets. Yeah, you're dead meat. Do I, piece of shit. do I need all that? No. Will I take it? Heck yeah. My duty gun looks kind of like that, but you know what? This still works. I'm still proficient with it. I'm tired of people. Here, Chuck, since you're. I got one of those. I like it. 
It's a fun little pistol. Dan Wesson. <clears throat> yeah, I wouldn't carry that. I mean, I would for like a barbecue gun or what well, it's kind of like kind of like backup iron sights on the rifle. Like you just put them on there so the internet doesn't make fun of you. Um uh yeah, like I would carry that so that somebody wouldn't be like, oh, I saw Pressburg out on the streets and he didn't have an EDC. He's not really about living this life. <laughs> like, OK, look, here's my token gun. That's it's right. Seven rounds of 45 ACP. Don't carry you think this. that's enough? I didn't think I was going to get a gunfight in the first fucking place. I'm literally just carrying this to go to the store. Or exactly. Whatever, you know. Exactly. But it's too it's too easy to get in an argument on on the Facebooks. Oh, even better right here. 22 mag uh kilt in the streets Ooh, nice. <laughs> i carried an eight shot 32 air weight when i was in street crimes man contact yeah. the hookers and shit and bus stop bus stop gun that type of shit so shut the fuck up man it had its place yep if, if i'd have carried the, the rolling special bitches being like what's up officer that's right they see that little cocksucker with tape on the hammer they're like what's up homie <laughs> like, what's up so done stole this bitch in a burglary right i mean fuck man yes. Time and place, knuckleheads. Uh, yeah, people just want to be relevant. They just want to try to call each other out for internet yes. cred, and they don't want understanding, and they don't want to help others to understand. We've, we've devolved. Yeah. Well, I don't know about we, but I mean, they. this conversation has devolved. Oh, no, I I think uh, that's almost two hours. I think that's that was a cool discussion. Ken, man, oh, so over the years with the light usage shit, is there anything right now as you go around the country, you're saying, you said, what in the flying fuck are y'all talking about? Or do you, is it pretty uh, much a good system? question? So, and, and, I, and I will get on my high horse for a second. Um, there was no doctrine when I started uh, this stuff. And that's why I decided to ask a lot of the who, what, when, where, and how's. And um, I've always had a really open mind to what the limits are on these tools and where they specifically fit in. And just because I'm carrying a light doesn't mean I'm going to use it. I prefer not to, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I carried more than one. That that's a, that's a doctrine for me. I don't you know, if I have a 50, if I don't have nothing, but I have a 50, I'm good. I, I fought for years with a 65 lumen surefire 6P. I thought that was the heat. I was like, God, look at this thing. 65 lumens. I can't, can believe it uh you know and now we're looking at you know crazy numbers there it's great it's all good uh it's all contextual it's all uh needed you know and people were they'll, they'll throw a number out there on uh lumen which is just a measure of volume it doesn't tell you anything about where you're putting that volume i mean this this light bulb here puts out crazy amount of lumen but it really doesn't do anything tactically it's just shooting out all over the place a lot of questions that people don't know, but um, the biggest thing I'm going to say about lights that I've seen even today is people don't understand how to use them properly. They underutilize them and they don't get the magic of blinding people in confrontations and getting away with it and never actually hurting the subject. And not pointing a That's gun. Fundamentally altering my odds in that confrontation. And I don't care, you know, what the number is once you get to a certain level let's call it 65 you know uh you know what what more does is it does do more for me but it also has some liabilities to it too you know obviously um in which we go through but i codified doctrine and i don't think much has changed because it was basically simple you know once you put it out there you go i can't really argue with the idea that uh I need to understand my lighting environment, read the light first before I start shooting flashlights off and weapon mounted lights off or combination. I got to know what environment I'm in uh, first. That is a principle of operating in low light. That hasn't changed. But guys don't even understand that. If I ask people that have weapon mounted lights, have the coolest gear, they can give me no, I don't even know what this, honestly, I don't even know what the cool stuff is anymore. But I can ask them, what are the basic principles of deploying a, a, a white light tool in a low light environment, you know, non-permissive? And they'll go, I don't know. So you, you tell me you understand where this tool is. And so, you know, the way I, I look at uh, illumination tools is 
you could have a $20,000 katana in your hand, doesn't make you a swordsman. Uh, lighting is like that. It, there's a lot to it. So as I go around the country, I'm just going to say lack of basic understanding of how to use these things. We don't need more cool tools. Uh, we need to understand how to deploy them, what their limitations are, what their liabilities are, but and how we can leverage them a lot better. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Portland uh, PD, I'll just call them out. I went up there years ago. I, I, I helped develop these really powerful HID spotlights. They're pretty small handheld. They put out 5,000, which was a lot. You know, you can, you can drop a dude as far as visually three, 400 meters away. They cannot see anything. And um, I literally went out on some calls with them where they had some areas where a lot of known, uh, you know, felons, would hang out. They could never get close to them because they had their scouts and the whole thing. And I literally, we lit that place up with six, 5,000 lumen lights from a cliff, literally from a cliff. And we just herded them across the field and into a waiting net of officers. We, it was literally like a friggin' fisherman. The warrants they got out of that was fantastic. Nobody forced those guys to move. They did it under the power of a, I call it the power of light. And they were very disconcerted, very disoriented people. So that's an example, just one example of using light in an unconventional way where you can uh, destroy it. Now, bad guys know this. Look what was going on in, um, you know, with lasers now and white lights and strobing lights, you know, by the opponents. They get it. You, they can't, you can't see. Uh, but law enforcement, I'm telling you, don't really know how to use them. Even military guys don't know how to use them. They don't know when to shut them off. They don't know when to turn them on. And they get very parochial about it. So I, I always, I, when I roll into groups, I said, here's the left and right lateral limits. Don't use your lights. Keep your lights on all the time. Those are the left, right, right, lateral limits. Those are the possibilities. And I go, it doesn't fall cleanly on a spreadsheet. I, that's the, you know, so there is no perfect doctrine. There are principles of using it, but every group is going to have to figure out uh, and every team and every individual need to spend more time with those. So that, that's something I am sort of a subject matter expert in uh, just because I have so many reps with it from so many different groups and so many objections being met. You know, look, man, I'm not telling you to change what you're doing. I just need to have you understand why you're doing it. And then when they come to an understanding, they say, uh, that wasn't such a good idea on their own. I don't have to sit there and preach to them. I just like, yeah. So, uh, you know, more work, more time, less nomenclature and numbers. Uh, there's a lot of good tools out there that, you know, totally blow away what I was using. And I'm pretty sure I could use what I used to use to, you know, a great advantage. And still, it's how you use them, obviously, as you know this. So uh, anybody who's listening, you know, that's great. You got the latest toy. Can you use it? I don't know. Can you? <laughs> that's a question. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I think it might be time to, to close up. I know Chuck's been broadcasting for at least 12 hours now straight. <laughs> Not quite that long, but yeah, okay. it's been. 11, 11, 11 and a half. half. Um, so before we end, let's get some final plugs, some final thoughts. If there's anything you need to promote that you feel the need to promote, now's a great time. Also, inter yeah, definitely interested in, in your final thoughts. So, Ken? Um, I was really great hearing from uh, these other gentlemen. You know, I I, uh, I love knowing there's guys that are literally sharpening the spear still, if you will. I know it's a kind of, you know, euphemism, but it's true. And, and Bill, glad to meet you, Matt, you know, Ian and everybody else, Matt, you know, the other, Matt, it just, it's, it's great. It's great to know there's guys out there and uh, it just motivates me uh, to know that. And we might be a small part in turning the machine in a better direction. Uh, so that, that's, that's good. I, and I will say, you know, on the, on the selfish promotion, uh, you did promote by low light manual on the last one, progressivecombat.com. Uh, I did get tons of guys, uh, coming in and grabbing that. Uh, so I appreciate that, but that, that's really where I, you know, I have other things on that site, articles that I've written, uh, one that, uh, Bill alluded to, and it's just my thoughts on different topics as I've been through 30 years of, uh, exposure to a lot of different groups and i will leave you with this i'm still a student i'm mm -hmm. more of a student than i've ever been in my whole life and um 
and I appreciate everybody's input on this stuff and uh, just keep your ears open, eh? So thanks, guys. Awesome. Bill? I'm Bill. I like the dynamic warrants and I like beating up crazy fuckers. Just kidding. <laughs> Wait, you're kidding that you don't like that or? <laughs> no, well, actually, I, yeah, I mean, it's kind of that. Nah, nah, that's it, man. Thanks. There's an interesting topic for sure. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if this went where you wanted to go. It didn't. Um, it didn't. Or not, I think we kind of got in the weeds and some shit, but but maybe that's a good thing to to kind of delineate, you know, TTP from strategy from fucking this that the earth thing type of shit. So I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there's a a lot of shit. I think it's driven by public opinion, um, b- both good and bad, right? I mean, there's there, there's a lot of shit that I, I, dudes just kind of need to. Um, I don't know. I open their eyes maybe a little bit more and, and recognize some limitations of shit and maybe realize that they're also being uh, manipulated in some degree for reasons less than um, admirable sometimes, right? It's, it Maybe it ain't about your fucking safety. Uh, maybe it isn't about you going home. Maybe it's about the fucking the, the dollar bills that go along with the activity versus how safe it is for you and for the community. Um, and that is unfortunate that sometimes leaders put us in those positions where we got to make a decision about whether we're going to violate policy and be insubordinate or, um, or not. Right. And so, I mean, I made that decision a long time ago. And it's one of the things I talked about my, my team leader class is that if you are not willing to be insubordinate, then you shouldn't be a fucking team leader because some, at some point you're going to encounter a boss that's going to say something fucking dumb or try to restrict you from doing what's right. And then you got to look in the mirror. So answer the question right now, whether or not you're going to do the right thing for you and the men, or you're just going to be a subservient dickhead. And if the answer is subservient dickhead, then that ain't the job for you, man. Stay in assault or stay, whatever the fuck it is. And, and don't put yourself in a leadership position. And that's all I got on that. Well, that applies to cops in general and enforcing yeah. things that might infringe on rights. Absolutely. Wow. Chuck. Uh, happy to uh, to get back on PNS and hang out with some cool guys on this panel. Uh, not a real sexy topic, but it's kind of how the sausage is made. Like when people are frustrated about why they can't do this or why they don't have this tool available to them or why think why their regional policing is different than some other regional policing. Uh, it, it all goes back to you, you got to understand the process because you, you've been taught p- policy and case law. Well, you know, you ain't got no effect on no case law unless you're the dumb son bitch that, that create, that's creating the new precedent. But that policy, where did it come from? What, why are your hands being tied? How did that happen? Um, what are the effects of blindly taking best practices and policies from others that potentially they didn't go the extra mile to, to prove to get that wider range fan on their policy? They accepted a more restrictive policy because it was the easy button. And do you want to have an easy button or do you want to have an effective policy that gives you the, the greatest latitude, uh, what, what we call the range of reasonableness? I'm learning these new cop terms. Uh, instead of a continuum of a bat belt, I have a range of reasonable options in my bat belt. Uh, so uh, if you want that range to be as wide as possible, then then you've got to do the hard work and nobody's going to do that work for, for you but you. You're the person that affects change. Um, so uh, somebody once said, if, if you have to wear a badge a sign that shows that when you walk into a group of people that that tells them that you're in charge, you're, you're not. And conversely, if you walk into a crisis and you ask who the fuck is in charge, you are. And so when it comes to changing policy, uh, if you're asking who the hell is going to get this fixed, the, the answer is you. Uh, and and building building a consensus that uh, the direction that you think uh, is the right, you sounding board off people that you trust, you build consensus, and then you move forward with a unified front to affect positive change within your sphere of influence. That that's how you that's how you win one squad at a time. You know. So, uh, Ken, it was a pleasure to meet you, man. Um, I, I am one of those white light deficit guys. Uh, I'll, I'll admit it. I use white light in a very specific context in a very, uh, very narrow focus. And it's interesting to hear guys uh, talk about white light from the standpoint of the op for 
Um, like, hey, I, I love the OKW mod light because of the throw that that light gives. And that's what I would want if I was chasing a fool down in a field. But as an op four, my dual fuel surefire has more spill that when I was opposing other people, guys that were still pointing their gun over here, they were still getting a piece of me with that light. And I was still as blind as a bat uh, with that light in that context. So they're both, you know, that thousand plus lumen light, but how that light is being directed and what the task that you want that light to do var varies a whole bunch. And I thought that was pretty cool hearing that from like, not formally trained military or LE guys, but dudes that just play paintball against professional military and LE guys, given that kind of hood rat feedback on, uh, on effective white light uses. So it's definitely something I want to dig into more. Cool. Good stuff. Oh yeah. The, the topic definitely wasn't one of those sexy ones, but this Webley Mark six is. Yeah. Uh, big thanks to the panelists. Awesome. Awesome to have everyone on again. Uh, we just have wonderful people that come on and, and share awesome insights. Um, big thanks to the Patreon subscribers. Big thanks to you to listen for listening or watching. And it was because the Patreon subscribers that we were able to do the last summit. Next one's coming up in May. Um, there's going to be some slight changes. Uh, some of the classes are going to be a little different. More, more information coming soon. But big thank you to our sponsors, Big Tech's Ordnance, Filster Holsters, Primary Arms, Staccato, and Walther. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you like, subscribe, and share. And currently, I would have shared this, but I'm in Facebook jail at the moment. I called someone a parrot. Facebook silliness. So that's all. I am going to hopefully edit this immediately and post it. So thanks, we'll see you.